Gary Bradbury isn't just a fun name to say. He is perhaps the most obscure NASCAR Cup Series driver from the sport's golden age. A part-timer for the late 1990s, Bradbury left the sport as quietly as he entered it, but what he accomplished during that brief time is worth a closer look. Gary Arnold Bradbury was born in Chelsea, Alabama on January 27, 1961. From an early age, he raced just about anything he could get his hands on cross-country motorcycles, go-karts, and many modifieds. He almost always ran number 78, which first gained notoriety from his family-owned team, Bradbury Racing. Nicknamed Shoes by his crew, Bradbury showed surprising speed despite limited sponsorship and began a steady rise through the ranks of professional stock car racing. In 1985, Bradbury competed in NASCAR's All-American Challenge Series. His best recorded finish was a third in a 200-lap race at Bristol, trailing Dave Mater III and Bruce Battle. Five years later, after a difficult stretch in the NASCAR Sportsman Series, he found success in the Winston All-Pro Series. This was the same late model division where Carl Long scored a single victory at Bristol in 1997. Though Bradbury finished just 38th in his series debut at the Nashville Fairgrounds, and a crash during the Snowball Derby sent his car into the woods off Turn 4, he earned 10th in the series standings. Bradbury committed to the All-Pro Series full-time in 1991, running both Pontiacs and Buicks. In June, at the Greenville Pickens Speedway, he started outside pole and led the opening 10 laps before ignition failure knocked him out. A month later, July 6th at the Volusia County Speedway, he passed Jody Ridley for the lead with 15 laps to go and held off Randy Porter for the victory. While he wouldn't win again in the next two full-time seasons, he finished top 10 in 31 of his 59 career starts and ranked no worse than 8th in the series standings. By then, ARCA came calling, and with it the opportunity to compete on super speedways. His first two series starts came at Talladega and Daytona. At Talladega on May 2, 1992, he was running inside the top 20 with four laps to go when he was involved in a crash, leaving him 23rd. He then impressed in the 1993 opener at Daytona, lining up 6th, only to be collected in another pileup after just two laps. The 1994 season saw Bradbury Racing make the full-time jump from late models to stock cars, a bid at the ARCA national title. Sponsorship had finally come from Redline Oil, soon to be joined by GM Quick Lube and MPT Engine Treatment. And while his second ARCA 200 would also be cut short after another early crash, he wouldn't have to wait long for his first victory. May 6, 1994, the Southern 200 at the Five Flag Speedway saw Bradbury with his first career ARCA pole. Three more poles would follow that season. He showed just as much speed in the race itself, leading the first 106 laps. In the late stages, Frank Kimmel appeared to have the winning strategy, opening up a two-lap lead with 50 to go. But when Kimmel had to pit under Green, Bradbury and Bobby Bauscher settled the win between themselves. On the final lap, Bradbury took his first checkered flag a full 16 seconds ahead of Bauscher. He led 145 of the 200 laps that day, lapping all but two of the 23 other starters. Bradbury was easily the fastest, so I can't complain, said Kimmel after the race, but if I had caught him with a yellow for a last pit stop, they'd have been in trouble. At Flat Rock, someone stole Bradbury's race car and equipment, but he managed to recover them all in enough time to start. There, he passed a dominant Dave Weltmeyer in the fast Rulo Brothers Chevrolet to score his second career win. He'd win a third race in the penultimate round at Winchester, leading from flag to flag. White flag is in the air, one lap to go, and Ron, I think Gary Bradbury has this one in the bag. Kimmel's going to close in. He's going to probably try one more time, but Bradbury's got three car lengths on him now. Whoa, Whoa here comes Kimmel. Now it's getting tighter here. Kimmel makes a last-ditch effort off of turn four, and Bradbury holds on for the checkered flag. What a fantastic finish there as Frank Kimmel moves up to make it an exciting finish in the Featherlight Trailers 150. By then, Bradbury had done more than enough to win Rookie of the Year in ARCA, but had fallen well short of the championship. He finished third in the standings, trailing the only two drivers he didn't lap during his first win, Bobby Bauscher and Frank Kimmel. Even then, it was Bradbury who had the last laugh. On November 13th at the same Atlanta track where ARCA closed out their season, Bradbury stayed a couple extra days to make his NASCAR Winston Cup Series debut. He had earned a ride in Jimmy Means' number 52, Napa Ford, to attempt the season finale, the Hooters 500. 
With 56 drivers entered for 43 spots, it was a tall challenge for any driver, never mind a rookie. But Bradbury qualified 12th, and not on Hoosiers during the tire war that season, but Goodyear's. Dale Earnhardt, fresh from securing his 7th series title, only qualified 30th. Here is the 52 car of Gary Bradbury coming in for a pit stop. He was the big surprise, at least in qualifying, giving that car an excellent, excellent run. Started, started in 12th place here today. Just a great run for him. He was the Rookie of the Year in the ARCA Series. Won three races in his rookie year with the ARCA Series. Jimmy Means is very high on this young man and would like to get something worked out for him to drive his car full time next year. They're talking about it. Cooters will no longer continue to sponsor this race beginning next year. For the next three years at least, this will be called the Napa 500. So the sponsor of the 52 car becomes the race sponsor next year. Bradbury finished in 30th place, more than 50 laps back of the leaders, but still came home under power. He teamed up with Means again to attempt the 1995 Daytona 500 and would pull double duty with his ARCA team. And on February 12, 1995, Bradbury finally got a decent shot at showing what he could do in the ARCA 200. After back-to-back -back crashes in the opening six laps, it was Bradbury who started seventh, led a race-high 24 of the 80 laps, and filled the rearview mirror of Andy Hillenberg as Andy Belmont's crash cut the race short. Five laps to go, it's Hillenberg, followed by Bradbury, then Wallace and Rutman. Unfortunately, Bradbury missed the cut for the 500, and would also fail to qualify for his next three races. As Means then closed his team to serve as crew chief for Bud Moore Engineering, Bradbury attempted to bring his own team to Cup. Despite long odds, Bradbury actually qualified his car in two of his four attempts, starting 29th at Michigan and 30th at Charlotte, races which sent four and five teams home respectively. In both races, however, his luck was much different. He ran 41st at Michigan, then last at Charlotte after an accident. Station Center with driver Gary Bradbury. You brought up the first caution of the day. What happened up in turn two? Well, I tell you, we've been fighting a push in the car since we've been here and uh, done some things to loosen the car up a little bit. And the race started, it was still really tied up off the corners, but if anybody was behind me or went under me, the car really got loose getting in and uh, just got loose and lost to getting in one. Sun's out. Is it slick out there today? Well, I don't know. I've never, I tell you, the cars are really, everybody's been talking about how bad they are pushing, especially getting up off four, but yet uh, everybody's loosening them up. We loosened ours up, but then with somebody around me, I couldn't run. It was so loose getting in, but I uh, still had my push off, so just missed it today. Uh, bumper to bumper, all for all the parts come on with us. I hate it. I hate it was a short day for them, but uh, we'll try it again. All right, good luck to you, Gary Bradbury, who came up Thank to you. the All-Pro and ARCA ranks. Ken Squire to get here today. The following cup race was the AC Delco 400 at Rockingham on October 22nd. Among the 47 teams entered to fill the 43-car lineup was A.G. Dillard's number 31 Hardy Chevrolet. A year earlier, Dillard had come to the Cup Series with his Bush Series driver Ward Burton and competed for one of the most hotly contested Rookie of the Year battles in many years. After brother Jeff Burton took rookie honors, Ward continued with the team into 95, but parted ways in August. After both Greg Sachs and Jimmy Hensley struggled to even qualify for races, Dillard hired Bradbury for Rockingham. There, the Alabama driver was again a surprise. He put the car 12th on the grid, the team's third best start of the entire year. On lap 257, Bradbury was still on the lead lap around 18th spot when his run came to an abrupt end. Andretti? No, it's 31 Gary Bradbury. Oh, he was on the lead lap all day. And Buddy can tell us what a terrible spot turn two is up there. Well, what happens? You come out there and the car just jumps out towards the wall. The win that day went to none other than Ward Burton, the first of his career and the first for Bill Davis Racing. Bradbury closed out the 95 season with a 29th place finish in the Atlanta finale. Dillard's team shut down and Bradbury would again have to fight for a full-time Winston Cup ride. In 1996, after he once again failed to qualify his own car at Rockingham, Bradbury earned a part-time ride with the Sadler Brothers racing team. Founded by Earl Sadler, of no relation to Hermie and Elliott, the team's number 95 had never made more than 11 starts in any one season, with any one driver, dating back to their debut in 1984. Carrying the team's longtime sponsor, Shoney's Restaurants, Bradbury qualified for his first attempt at Dover, taking 26th on the grid. In the next 12 attempts, he'd make eight of them, and failed to finish only three. Among these were his first starts in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona and the Southern 500. He also put up another monster lap at Atlanta, lining up 14th. 
but it was at the Brickyard 400 where Bradbury turned the most heads. Coming into Indianapolis, sponsor Shoney's had arranged a contest where the winner would get to have breakfast with Bradbury at one of their restaurants the day before the 400. Whether the driver would get to do anything else that weekend was anything but certain. In testing, the Sadler team blew an engine, then ran well off the pace in Thursday practice. After more struggles in first round qualifying, Bradbury spoke with Ricky Rudd, who he'd known for years. With that, he took to the track for second round qualifying. Yep, Ricky Craven on the bubble, and the guy trying to knock him off is Gary Bradbury. There you see the lineup as it is. They're 26 through 38 make the field. 38th lower, do not again. Provisionals are available. Gary Bradbury yesterday. The Shoney's Restaurant Ford and Man Whiskey High coming off the corner. He got awfully close to that wall up there where Dale Jarrett hit it yesterday. But he was fast up in that area of the racetrack. Let's see how it all comes together around the two and a half miles. And he did it. Bradbury did it. Morgan Shepard now goes to the uh, bubble, and Bradbury qualifies at 174.584, and wow. that is the 26th fastest, fastest second round. That is a fantastic lap. Wow. Gary Bradbury, 51.551. Man, what a lap. Where was this yesterday? Well, I tell you, I don't know. Uh, we were on a 51.70 something practice yesterday and then qualified at 52.38. And then this morning we run a 5160 something. I thought, man, I hope we don't come back with a 5220 something or something, you know. But uh, well, I tell you, this ain't sunk in yet. Uh, Dennis Adcock, crew chief, kept telling me, said, we're going to be 26 fastest. We're going to be 26. And I'm thinking, I just won in this race. But uh, I tell you, I'm on. Dennis and these boys have worked their tails off this weekend on the Shoney's Ford. And uh, I know I'm most exciting. This is the most exciting day, day of my career, I think, since I've been racing. Uh, and, you know, Dennis was talking earlier one time. He told somebody, he said, I've never seen Gary. He said, a lot of drivers, their hands are shaking before and after qualifying. Well, hey, he hadn't looked today because I'm shaking. <laughs> Gary Bradbury, 26 fats. is still one car to go, and he's on the clock, Bob. Bradbury's lap of 174.584 miles per hour made him the second day fastest qualifier, nearly three miles per hour faster than he'd run in Thursday practice. He was also more than a full mile per hour faster than the other 14 drivers who took time that day, including A.J. Foyt, who missed the show. Not only had Bradbury made the field for one of the sport's richest races, but he'd earned an additional $82,500 bonus. Fans flocked to get his autograph, an unreal experience for the driver whose only previous exposure to Indy was through the windows of a tour bus. I was headed to a race up north, he said, and I took a bus tour of this racetrack. In fact, me and my mother were by ourselves pulling my race car, so I've come a long way since then. Bradbury started 26th and finished 29th. We're just working on getting this thing to finish the show and stay out of trouble, he said before the race. He succeeded. Despite a 7th in his return to the ARCA 200 for Stan Hoover's team, Bradbury's 1997 Cup season got off to a rough start with back-to-back -back DNQs for the Daytona 500 and the following round at Rockingham. This was the same year NASCAR mandated drivers weighing under 160 pounds carry added iron weight in their cars, which docked not only Bradbury, but also Mark Martin, Jeff Gordon, John Andretti, Ward Burton, and Greg Sachs. Finishing last in the 97 Rockingham race was Loy Allen Jr. This turned out to be Allen's last start with TriStar Motorsports, the team with which he won the pole for the 1994 Daytona 500. Bradbury was swapped in for the following race at Richmond, but the child support recovery team struggled. In the first 14 races, Bradbury failed to qualify four times and only once finished better than 31st. The Alabama driver did, however, continue to surprise in qualifying on occasion, putting up the 14th fastest time for the spring race at Darlington. In hindsight, he probably should have qualified his own car at Sears Point. Road ringer Ken Peterson could only manage 38th. Then again, when Bradbury took over the ride on Sunday, a blown engine left him next to last. During the same 97 season, still another single car team was looking for help. This was Jim Wilson's program Triad Motorsports, which had attempted a few races each year since 1993. Each time, they ran drivers who were virtual unknowns in the series, giving each a shot at competing in Cup. Jay Hedgecock was their first driver, who finished 26th in his debut during the Fall 93 race at North Wilkesboro. 
Open wheel driver Pancho Carter made a few starts, as did Canada's Randy McDonald and owner driver Billy Standridge. At Sears Point, Wilson even handed the wheel to Tom Hubert, who at the time worked as a tire changer for Bahari Racing. By the summer of 97, Triad had sponsorship from Haynes Underwear, but started just six of the first 20 races. Even veteran Bobby Hillen Jr. couldn't end a streak of four straight DNQs heading into the August race at Michigan. That changed with Gary Bradbury, who immediately put the car 36th on the grid. Next came Bristol, where the driver once again needed to perform in second round qualifying or head home. He elected to run scuffed tires and put up a lap of 122.131 miles per hour. And just like at Indianapolis a year earlier, this was by far the fastest lap of the session. It would have been good enough for 17th if it had happened in the first round. None of the other six drivers who made attempts qualified for the race. We were about the quickest car out there during practice before qualifying, said Bradbury after the lap at Bristol. The only problem I was worried about was that our quickest time wasn't fast enough to make the top 38. If it wasn't, we'd be going home. Gene Wilson, manager for the number 78 team, was elated. You know, Gary's a darn good race car driver, but he's never had the chance to prove it in the right car, he said. Hopefully we can give him that chance. While a crash left Bradbury 37th in the Bristol race, he recovered in the Southern 500 to finish 25th, the best the Triad team had finished in more than a year. Just like that, Bradbury had found a new home, one which happened to be running the same number as his family-owned team. Wilson re-signed Bradbury for the 1998 season, when the Triad team welcomed new sponsorship. Years before Michael Lynette made a single NASCAR start, Pilot Travel Centers agreed to back the number 78 for the full season. Triad Motorsports hoped for a strong start to the year and would get a chance to start earlier than most. Bradbury's heroics in second round qualifying had paid off as NASCAR introduced a new 25-lap qualifying race for the exhibition Bud Shootout. While the Triad team had upgraded to Ford's new Taurus body, they were among the Ford efforts to still run 1997 Thunderbirds on the super speedways, as they did in this race. Bradbury drew fourth in the field of 14 and finished in 11th. But from the Daytona 500 onward, the effort was a struggle. Bradbury failed to qualify for seven of his next ten attempts. It's been terrible, he said after he failed to qualify for the spring race at Talladega. I don't know what the problem is. We came to Talladega last week and we were really slow. We brought a brand new car back down here and it's about the same speed. We've been struggling. At Indianapolis, he again needed to put up a good time in second round qualifying, but the result was less than desirable. Tough break for the driver of the 78. You see the damage on that car, number 78, Gary Bradbury. Boy, just it just gets, goes from bad to worse here in second round qualifying. He hit it hard coming out of one, didn't he? He did, but again, they have no choice but go out and try to do something that's impossible to do almost. It's a long walk back from uh, the Clarion Medical Center here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Gary, what happened out there? Well, we just, uh, we've just really been fighting a, a push since we got here and made a lot of changes on the car, but hadn't helped any. We made more changes before qualifying and the car pushed really bad on the get-go lap as far as up off the corner, but uh, the changes we'd made just loosened us up too much getting in and just got loose getting in one. And track's so flat, if the car slips much, it's hard to catch it. You told me two weeks ago you lost your primary engine builder, Larry Wallace, when Roger Penske bought that group, and you've been trying to fight from a down horsepower position, trying to make it up yourself, and it's just that almost impossible for the driver to do it. Oh, well, yeah, you know... Uh, we had some decent motors this weekend and everything, but we just got out there and uh, never really got a handle on it. And, you know, when you go qualify, uh, you run the car a little extra hard, and we loosened the car up. It, it ended up being looser than what I expected getting in, and, you know, just uh, it's hard to make it up. Well, come back hard in two weeks. We'll see you at Michigan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ironically, when Bradbury did make this show, he was still among the fastest, 20th in Atlanta, 16th in the fall race at Charlotte. In a one-off for Bob Honcher at New Hampshire, he even earned the second-best starting spot by the infamous Tabasco fiasco, taking 11th on the grid. But even with these runs, controversy quickly followed. At Texas in April, Bradbury qualified 10th, but was blamed for a 14-car pileup in Turn 2 after he was rear-ended by David Green. Bradbury said he didn't break loose, and that Green's contact was what turned him sideways. The next month in the Coca-Cola 600, Bradbury charged from 34th in practice to 8th in qualifying, which even shocked the driver. The car was really loose last practice when we went out, he said, but the weather cooled off and we didn't touch the car. The track came to us just perfect. We were a little tight in turns 3 and 4, but we were perfect in 1 and 2. I think that's where we made most of our time. 
After falling back in the order during the race, Bradbury was just looking to finish. He was still running with just 22 laps to go when this happened. To give him a good race car. We Got a car in the wall. Oh boy, Bradbury has crashed the 78. This makes a whole different race now that brings everybody back into contention on the lead lap. The caution allowed the field to catch leaders Bobby Labonte and Rusty Wallace. And when this allowed Jeff Gordon to make a four-tire stop and take the victory, one article, perhaps jokingly, speculated that Bradbury wrecked on purpose, even though he appeared to have right front damage before he even hit the wall. This frustration carried over into the season finale at Atlanta, which had arguably become Bradbury's best track, at least in qualifying. The 48th and final driver to take time, he made a determined run, but ended up overdriving it. Are the uh, margins between first and 25th? Whoa! Spinning coming off of corner number four. Keep it off the wall, Gary. And a oh! I thought he was going to save it, and he didn't. Well, that's too bad. He had a good lap going too. He was, he was not going to win the pole, but he was going to be up there in the top, uh, certainly the top 10 or 12, oh. if he would have made it back. That was a heartbreaker yesterday because the car from the time we unloaded was really fast, he said. You could go out and run an easy lap, and you were still quick, so that was a sickening deal to crash in qualifying. We were a little loose qualifying, and it looked like maybe we had a tire bottom out on a fender. Bradbury was the only driver to fail to complete a lap, but once again, there was still second round qualifying. And guess what happened this time? That's right, he ran 189.922 miles per hour, fastest of the second round for at least the third time in his career, and putting him back into the Bud Shootout qualifier for 1999. Row number five, Gary Bradbury in the Pilot Travel Center Ford, and Kenny Wallace in the Square D Chevy. Joining the crew was Hutch Strickland, who was out of a ride after the previous year, part of what was now an all-Alabama effort. There was also new sponsorship from Farb Hangover Relief. Bradbury finished next to last in the qualifier, then damaged the nose of his car in his twin 125, dropping him out of the 500. As sponsorship dried up, the team withdrew from their next three scheduled starts, which would be Wilson's last as a team owner. Bradbury failed to qualify for two more cup races with Stan Hoover, and would make his only four Bush Series starts that summer with a best of 20th at Pikes Peak for Larry Lockamy's team. Late in the 99 season, Bradbury was again called upon for his qualifying prowess, this time by Larry Hedrick Motorsports. The race was Atlanta, and the result was the same. Bradbury qualified the Kodiak Chevrolet ninth on the grid, the team's best start at the track in five years. The following year, when Rick Mast parted ways with Hedrick after only six races, Bradbury came back on board for the next three, getting the number 41 into the field at both Texas at Martinsville. He failed to finish both races. That December, NASCAR announced they would eliminate second round qualifying for the upcoming year. After that, Bradbury would only attempt one more race. On June 16, 2002, Gary Bradbury made his 47th and final cup start, although barely. This time, the ride belonged to Junie Donlavey, and again involved Rick Mast. When Mast was having medical tests performed for what turned out to be carbon monoxide poisoning, Hermie Sadler had been called in to drive in relief. But on this week, Sadler was slated to run a Bush Series race in Kentucky. This brought on Ed Barrier, who previously drove for Don Levy during his rookie season in 2000. But when Barrier also had to cancel, Bradbury was brought on board. All for just 72 laps around the Michigan track before handling woes left him in last place. By this point in Gary Bradbury's career, his brother Charlie was becoming a winning driver in his own right. Still driving for the family team, Charlie became a full-time competitor in NASCAR's Kodak Southeast Series, the same all-pro late model division where Gary got his start. In 2003, Charlie scored his first career win at the Nashville Fairgrounds, the first of eight straight finishes of sixth or better that carried him to the series championship. He also won the Snowball Derby that year. The Bradbury team moved up to the Truck Series, where in his second start at Memphis, Charlie finished 16th. He began attempting Bush Series races, with his sights surely set on making it to Cup. But too soon, that journey would be cut short. On October 7, 2006, Charlie Bradbury was killed in a traffic accident while on his way home from the shop. He was only 24. On November 11th, prior to the World Classic at the Birmingham International Raceway, Gary took his brother's car onto the track for one final lap. Statistically, Gary Bradbury endured a frustrating Cup Series career. In his 47 starts, he failed to finish 21 times, never finished better than 23rd, and never finished on the lead lap. 
He failed to qualify at nearly a 50% rate, 40 times in 87 attempts. He never started more than 16 races in any one season, and never once started a race for one of NASCAR's top teams. But that's where things get interesting. Bradbury raced for 10 different cup teams, including his own, and in the combined careers of all 10 teams, they have a total of just one Cup Series win. That win, Jody Ridley's for Junie Donlavey at Dover in 1981, wouldn't have even been part of the statistic had Bradbury not been selected as the third relief driver for a single start, the last of his career. Thus, it's less significant that Bradbury failed to qualify 40 times, and more so that he even made the other 47. In fact, in 11 of those races, he qualified inside the top 20, a rate of nearly 1 in 4. Five came in Atlanta alone, including his series debut, and on two different track configurations. So adept was Bradbury in qualifying that he was a second-round fastest qualifier for at least one race in three consecutive seasons, and did so at three radically different tracks. It's when looking at a career like Bradbury's that one realizes success can sometimes be a matter of perspective. So what do you think? Would Gary Bradbury have performed any better if he picked up a ride with Hendrick, Gibbs, or Penske? Let me know in the comments. A special thank you to John, who requested this video during my Trekside coverage in Las Vegas. I've got some more driver profiles like this in the works, so be sure to subscribe to this channel for more. In America, there exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard. On the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes, to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona, all the way to the shores of California, and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks.